cleaning the palace. This is the cook guy, or the chef. Hyper good morning, huh? When, I'm, when I wake up in the morning, I'm always so very hungry. When it's lunchtime, I'm also so very, very... Hi, uh, my name is James Kahn. Uh, people call me Hank, and I am from running for United States Senate in the state of California. I am running as a Green Party candidate. When you think about people like Kamala Harris, and you think of people like Elizabeth Warren or Joseph Biden, and you think about the campaign promises that they made and aren't true now, such as Medicare for All, abolishing student debt, the children that sit at the borders, and these horrible things, and you think to yourself, it's been 11 months, and you know these are promises that are not kept. I am a Green Party candidate, and people will always ask me about my opposition, I say, well, in a world, where the only other candidates are green and the only other politicians are green, what would I provide to you? What would any green provide to you? They would build a world away from oil. They would have, and I have, a platform that is about saving and establishing the environment for future, future generations, the environment above all else. Behind me, I am in the Redwood Forest in Northern California. These trees were once a thousand years old and two thousand years old. We only see trees now that are maybe fifty to maybe two hundred years old. But think of all these great giants that they came up on and just chopped down and they said, okay, we stopped. But it's going to take a thousand years for them to reestablish. Everything we destroy now does not reestablish. So we must act today. Please vote green. And I am a Green Party of candidate. My name is Hank Kahn, and I am running for U.S. Senate in 2022. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, that was... <laughs> wow, I have another Raider. Or someone just played Screamo. Yeah, I think that's what happened. I think I have another raid, though. Um, <laughs> Andy Attack 2018. Thank you for the raid and this and Slayer Music. Thanks for playing Screamo. Um. Hey, welcome to uh, Just Calvin, also uh, basically global Green Party news uh, that goes pretty much globally as well as um, nationally as far as the USA goes. Anyway, this is coming from the Green Par uh, the Global Green Party News uh, dot, uh, well, yeah, dot news, Global Green dot news, there we go. Uh, Mexico's Greens, not environmentalists enough to fight uh, eco-fascism. Uh, this piece is uh, co-authored with Jules Onby. And just so you know, uh, my interview with, uh, with uh, James Kahn, the, uh, the uh, Senate candidate from California representing the Green Party will be on tomorrow live on StreamYard uh, at 1 p.m. Um, we will be talking about everything from his campaign uh, to his uh, policies and stuff of that nature. I've also asked him to look more into modern monetary theory and how it would help with the messaging for uh, his policies and the Green, the green uh, Party's policies as a whole. Uh, anyway, so Mexico's Green Party or El Partido Verde Eco uh, Ecologic Ecologic or ecological stuff, there we go, De Mexico, or PVEM, have a penchant for the controversial and the self-contradictory. Contra uh, despite present presenting itself as green, experts claim that the PVEM has been responsible for the significant environmental damage in the country. In one case, supporting the constru uh, construction of hotels that would destroy eco uh, ecologically uh, sorry, yeah, eco uh, nah, damn. <laughs> ecologically, there you go, important mang mangrove trees in 
Cancun. Beyond environmental issues, they have endorsed the return of the death penalty for kidnappers and representatives in the party have all times opposed same-sex marriage. Furthermore, the party has been accused of taking and handling or rather uh, handing out uh, bribes as well as designing policies to benefit the family business of their founder, George Emilio Gonzalez Martinez. Over the years, the PVEM has purchased real estate on every inch of the political spectrum. Uh, here supporting the death penalty, they're supporting bolstering public schooling, the party's frequent straying into right-wing territory and the death penalty issue in particular. However, it is so uncharacteristically green that it led the European Greens to withdraw the recognition of the PVEM as a fellow Green Party in 2009. Nevertheless, in spite of their controversial status, both at home and internationally, the PVEM continues to be one of the most significant political players in Mexico. All of this begs, begs the question, what, if anything, do the Mexican Greens stand for? The strongest possible condemnation of the Mexican Greens may be as a group of ecofascism, uh, ecofascists, excuse me. Ecofascism frames environmental degradation as part of a crisis of decade my, uh, modernity, modernity uh, a pro product of loose morals and the inferior cultures of uh, backward peoples. According to leader scholar Jeanette Bial, it first emerged in Germany where Nazi ideology was linked with traditional uh, agrarian romanticism and hostility to urban civilization. Many have noted the rise of ecofascism in radical right-wing groups. Ecofascist ideas about immigration control have penetrated into popular conservative political parties. A right-wing Green Party might be a good place for these ideas to ferment. However, it seems that the PVEM have not engaged in much ecofascist messaging. Their justification for the death penalty has nothing to do with the removal or removing, excuse me, bad elements of population control, and a lot to do with their conception of punitive justice, one shared by other Mexican political parties. They claim that it is the obligation of the state to confront the worst criminals with severity that they deserve. The PVEM has also supported better treatment of migrants passing through Mexico, unlike other conservative parties that, might get, that have given an environmental justification for restricting immigration. What is notable about the PVEM is not their combination of social conservatism and environmentalism, but the incon inconsistency of their support for both. As many have run before, the Mexican Greens corruption scandals tell a story of a party primarily focused on the profits of its founders, from paying influencers to post their support for them on social media to being involved in a Monday, Monday, sorry, money laundering scandals, to making unprecedented and less than kosher deals with the president in an effort to grow their own political power. It seems as though the only true constant in the PVEM's political platform is corruption. As one expert bluntly put it, the Partido Verde is the highest expression of political corruption. While it is not clear what the party truly really stands for, what has been made clear is that Green's, I'm oh, sorry, Green is largely a brand here and not a sign of a true commitment to environmentalist, eco fascist or otherwise. Well, uh, the Green Party of the U.S. has come out uh, with a statement about COP26, and it says that it will lead to climate collapse, 
In the Green Party, uh, Greens rebuke false solutions from world leaders call for a global Green New Deal. The Green Party of the United States said today that the COP26 with the World Climate Summit in Glasgow failed to produce the radical action scientists say is needed to avoid climate collapse and that the only way for humanity to prevent catastrophe for life on Earth is a global Green New Deal. The world's political leaders in Glasgow paid lip service to the need for the for effective climate action while working behind closed doors to protect the profits of fossil fuel companies and their own campaign contributions. Led by President Biden, the industrial polluters most responsible for the climate crisis continued to refuse the, to accept their responsibility for climate reparations to the countries most damaged by burning fossil fuels. The U.S. worked with China and India to weaken the language related to moving away from coal plants and subsidies for fossil fuels, said Green Party National Co-Chair Chris Stellar, Stella. Sorry. With over 25 years of COP uh, gatherings failing to produce real climate solutions, the Green Party said direct action by climate organizers is needed to halt fossil fuel use. We have no reason to believe corporate funded politicians, especially from the US, will voluntarily act to provide future generations with a chance of for decent lives, unquote, said Green Party National uh, Co Chair Margaret Elizabeth. Let's see. Media coverage called Glasgow the last chance COP, referring to the scant years that to prevent global heating from exceeding 1.5 C or 2.7F. The most optimistic reading of the Glasgow pledges have the world on track for 2.4C or 4.3F of heating. Though prior pledges have almost never been fulfilled, the climate crisis is already happening and getting worse as extreme weather events become more frequent with massive hurricanes, flooding, drought, wildfires, and heat waves. As the GOP, the GOP, COP26 coalition pointed out, the needs of fewer countries have been kicked to the curb in favor of appeasing the hugely overrepresented fossil fuel lobbyists. The Climate Justice Alliance said the final COP. 26 statements showed an utter disregard of the science and equity, false ambition and disdain for the justice and license to pollute with net zero and carbon markets. False climate solutions such as carbon trading and offsets, carbon capture and storage, and market-based mechanisms were included. This mix of costly, unproven, and even non-existent technologies provide political cover for the big polluters to continue business as usual at the expense of the world's most vulnerable people, said Green Party of Florida co-chair and candidate for Florida State Representative District 46, Robin Harris. In quotes, solving the climate crisis requires wholesale system change, a, new, a Green New Deal that combines a rapid transition to zero greenhouse gas emissions and 100% clean renewable energy with investments in social programs such as healthcare, living, wa uh, living wage jobs, education, and housing. We need to create a different world where the focus is on meeting the common needs, said Mark Dunley, co-chair of the Green Party's Echo Action Committee. The Green Party's outline for meeting the challenge presented by the climate crisis includes one, short-term mandatory actions with timelines and tar goals targeting the next five to 10 years, not 2050 or later. Include military greenhouse gas emissions, which account for 6% worldwide in accounting and mandates for cuts. 
creating an energy system that embraces the concept of public ownership and democratic control. In immediate declaration of a climate emergency by the president following the type following the type of leadership provided when President Roosevelt took over the American economy after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Green Party as the only as the only national party in the United States that does not accept corporate funding has called for Congress to fund a 2.7 trillion annual investment in climate action instead of Biden's build back worse I mean better plan. Biden's plan has shrunk to 55 billion per year in climate investments after corporate funded members of Congress have killed many of the most important parts of the bill. Now, in order to do that, you'd have to literally get Joe Manchin out of office. He is quite literally not only in bed with the coal with the coal industry and gas and oil, he lives with them. He lives, eats, breathes, and let's face it, has kids with the coal and oil and uh, gas and oil industry. His family is embedded in the coal mines in West Virginia. He is the ranking chairman of the of the was it, um, gas and oil reserves uh, committee or something to that effect. In other words, the environmental committee. Uh, you can't find anything more. Um, what do you call that? Um, invest in, in that conflict of interest as that. So I doubt there's anybody in West Virginia listening to this, but there is. When you have a chance, please vote him out if you absolutely want to uh, transition from clean energy or transition from coal, coal and oil and gas and into clean and renewable energy at 15 bucks an hour and with union jobs between get this guy out and vote for a Green Party candidate. Anyway, I'll be right back. And I'm back, obviously. Uh, one uh, piece of news, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I had to uh, call it out and report it. Uh, is Reuters, and this is uh, from today. Uh, I never thought I'd see the day where Republicans move to decriminalize marijuana at a federal level. I'm guessing that quite a few uh, Green Party, not Green Party, excuse me, uh, Republicans, oh, I confuse the two, but anyway, uh, I, just, I guess I was just talking about Green Party. Uh, Republicans have decided to, I'm guessing, uh, John, uh, I was a John Boehner. John Boehner is one of them. Uh, decided to get into the marijuana business, but with with uh, big tobacco, I believe. Let's see. Let's see what this says. Republicans in the House of Representatives introduced legislation on Monday that would decriminalize marijuana at the federal level and eliminate legal hazards facing men. Yeah, legal hazards facing many cannabis-related businesses while regulating its use like alcohol. Representative Nancy Mace of South Carolina, who was spearheading the legislation or legislative effort, described the bill as a compromise with less uh, erroneous regulations than measures proposed earlier by other lawmakers, including Democrats. Legislation's path uh, in the Democratic-controlled House was uncertain. Mace, Macy, or Mace, uh, a first-term lawmaker, said the measures and the measure has five Republican co-sponsors. Adult use of cannabis is legal in 18 U.S. states and allowed medically in 36 states, but it remains illegal under federal law, which has deterred banks and other investors from investment with companies that sell marijuana or related products. Mm -hmm. In quotes, the bill would ha also support businesses and particular small businesses. That's very important, Mace uh, told a news conference. Uh, if we were to pass this bill today, businesses would operate and be legal and regulated just like alcohol. 
is titled the State Reform Act. The Republican legislation would defer to state authorities on matters of prohibition and regulation. It would prohibit marijuana use by those under 21, restrict advertising, protect access to hiring and benefits for veterans who have used the cannabis, expunge the records of people convicted on nonviolent cannabis only related offenses. The bill diverges in several uh, important ways from draft legislation proposed in July by Senate Democrats, including Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Uh, uh, Mesa's uh, bill, oops, ah, sorry. Mesa's bill would impose a 3% ex, uh, excise tax on cannabis compared to an increased Senate uh, tax proposal that would top out at around 25%. Where the Senate proposal would give the Food and Drug Administration a primary oversight role, the Republican Legislation limits FDA involvement to medical marijuana and makes the Treasury's uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax, and Trade Bureau the primary regulator for inter inter interstate commerce. Okay, I guess was, that was the end of that. And more cannabis news is from hightimes.com. Indiana Democrats announce full support of recreational cannabis. Indiana Democrats are planning to stand the support of legalizing cannabis ahead of the upcoming legislative session. High tiny, uh, high, so highlighting, there we go, highlighting robust public support and the potential for any economic boon to the state. Democratic, Democrats in Indiana said Monday that they will pursue marijuana legalization in the forthcoming legislative session. The Indiana Democratic Party used the announcement to broadcast its support, full support for the effort to legalize recreational cannabis across the state and to put pressure on the on Hoosier State Republicans, namely Governor Eric Holcomb to get on board with the reform effort. Democrats also pointed to a recent survey showing that eight out of 10 Indiana adults back marijuana legalization. Legalize legalizing marijuana in some form is supported by about 80% of Hoosiers and would provide the opportunity to create an additional revenue stream for the state, create good paying jobs, didn't say union ghost, and uh, developed a long-term cash crop for in Indiana's uh, age and, or sorry, yeah, uh, AG and business communities to provide medicinal opportunities for people like the state's veterans and seniors, and could start the process of expunging records for simple possession across the state, the Indiana D Democratic Party said in the release. Monday's announcement from the Democrats came on an eve of an organization day. The ceremonial lunch, a launch, not lunch, but launch of the legislative calendar when lawmakers are sworn in and make preparations with their colleagues for the upcoming session, which will begin in January. Mike Schmuel, uh, chairman of the Indiana Democratic Party, said in the announcement that the Indiana Constitution constituents have looked to their neighbors to recognize the merits of legalization with fellow Midwestern states, Illinois, uh, Illinois and Michigan, both ending pro prohibition on pot inside their respective borders. Democrats said that Indiana residents are currently contributing millions of dollars to Michigan and Illinois economies where cannabis is legal. Legalizing marijuana is Indiana, in Indiana, the Democrats said, would ensure that the state economy would have a guaranteed cash crop in the long term for the state's businesses and farming communities, creating a revenue stream for the General Assembly to use in future sessions. Hoosiers have seen the impact their recreational and medicinal cannabis use has made on the states around us, and not only are they contributing to neighboring states' economies, Indiana is now on the verge of losing out altogether. 
the Republican supermajority at the state house is losing its economic common sense. If they're not, if they do not join Democrats this session in making the opportunity a winner for the House for the Hoosier state, uh, Schmoll said. Marijuana is a really popular issue, and a large majority of the Hoosiers want to see this get done. Democrats are, are ready to take the lead on this effort because it's a win win for Indiana and it'll fulfill the party's consistent promise of creating a better future. The Hoosiers families. It's time to legalize recreational cannabis across Indiana. Le uh, legalization would mark a massive change for law enforcement in Indiana, where a under current law possession of even a single joint is punishable by up to a year of incarceration and a fine of up to five thousand dollars, according to the Marijuana Policy Project or MPP. MPP said that Indiana is now one day, or sorry, no, is now one of only 14 states with no effective medical cannabis law, and one of only 19 that is still imposing jail time for simple possession of cannabis. The state Democratic Party said that along with broad public approval, there is, on, is also some uh, bipartisan support for legalization with some GOP uh, lawmakers eager to take the step. But Holcomb, currently serving his second term as governor, has voiced opposition to legalization in the, pa in the past. In 2019, Holcomb acknowledged that he smoked weed when he was in college, but that he could not get behind legalization until the federal government acted first. If the law changed, we would look at all the po positive or adverse impacts it would have, the governor said at the time. I am not convinced other states have made a wise decision. And I kind of want to go back to the basics as far as what um, I have done in the past. I have done uh, readings from uh, authors such as Duff H. Jelton, Warren Mosler, and others who are basically pioneers of what is now known as modern monetary theory. Uh, I wanted to read a little bit from this is from uh, was uh, money.usnews.com. And I'm hoping this is the precise um, definition or uh, kind of looking at what, mon what MMT is. Mon monetary theory was pioneered by American economist and theorist Warren Mosler in 92, along with Bill Mitchell and university professor based in, uh, a university professor based in Australia and a key developer of the theory. MMT argues that nations with the ability to produce their own fiat currency can issue as much money as they need, and as a result, they have no pressures when it comes to financing. In other words, the government cannot run out of money, and it essentially has no financial constraints. While the government should have a budget under this theory, the government doesn't necessarily have to worry about the deficit because it can fund projects by printing money from a the, from the central bank. The idea is that the that under MMT, because the U.S. has the dollar, it will no it would no longer have to borrow money; it would just print it. Says Andy Snyder, founder of Man Man Word Digest, a column that discussed macroeconomics in Baltimore. If the econ economic if the uh, economy is shrinking, Snyder continues that printing money would go into the economy to stimulate it. Otherwise, if the economy is booming, the government would not print as much money and pull back via taxes. If the uh, economy gets overheated, Snyder says. Supporters, like myself, of the theory say printing fresh money and government spending won't be a problem unless it's not managed properly, leading to high inflation as a result. However, MMT proponents say inflation and consumer demand can be managed by cutting back on spending and raising taxes. Tax revenues are not used for government funding under MMT, similar to what a business uses its revenues to pay for its expenses. Rather, taxes are used to control inflation, a widely disliked tax policy among many is increasing taxes, which is why Snyder says the bearish case for MMT is taxes never go up because they're unpopular and inflation runs rampant. 
that that is a fundamental principle of MMT. When there is too much demand in the economy, taxes must be raised to subdue demand. MMT has been embraced by progressives like AOC, uh, who will see MMT as a framework for increased government spending that could help finance initiatives such as the Green New Deal policy on, e on climate change. Stephanie Kelton, a professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University and leading advocate for MMT, served as economic advisor for Senator Bernie Sanders' uh, 2016 presidential campaign. MMT advocates say that government should be responsible for setting economic policy, which is currently part of the Federal Reserve's responsibility in mainstream economics. In, uh, in MMT, however, the Fed would have less control and setting monetary policy it would primarily help fund the government's debt. Let's see, there's also more of this. But there are a number of ec uh, economists who have been critical of MMT saying rising deficits are dangerous because they push up interest rates and lead to hyperinflation, which could have adverse impacts on investment returns. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell says the idea that deficits don't matter for countries that can borrow in their own currency is just wrong and that decisions about spending are meant for you when spe speaking before the Senate Banking Committee in uh, February 2019, Powell stressed that the purpose of the Fed as Central Bank of the U.S. is to maintain the stability of the financial system and to pursue full employment. Uh, legendary investor uh, Warren Buffett in another a stern critic of MMT, uh, MMT principles in action. Greg uh, Weimer, partner of Confluence Financial Partners in Pittsburgh, says the optimism view, uh, the optimistic or anyway, the view of this MMT is putting money in the uh, economy is a good thing. MMT has gained popularity throughout the years uh, when a government has stepped in to help relieve the, econ the economy in times of financial duress. This uh, this was seen during the Great Recession. The U.S. faced a critical financial hardship when the government had to step in and take quantitative easing measures through government spending, cutting taxes and lowering interest rates to near zero level. All, all this to get consumers to spend more and stimulate e uh, economic activity. This swift action didn't drive interest rates up, nor did it lead to uncontrollable inflation. Most recently, the, in uh, March 2020, the government had an even deeper and larger scale response compared to that of the Great Recession. Uh, in response to the global health crisis, federal authorities used fiscal policy to address the pandemic-induced recession through stimulus relief packages. The first was with Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic uh, Security Act, also known as the CARES Act, a $2.2 trillion economic stimulus bill signed into law in response to the economic fallout of the pandemic. As a result, a pumping, uh, uh, as a result of pumping a lot of money into the economy, there was more cash is in circulation, much of which poured into the stock market. Throughout 2020, a lot of that money went into stocks and exchange trade, traded funds in particular. This investing actively popped up asset prices, rising the valuation of their fundamentals and the stock market surged to all time highs. This, fun, this, this financial support from the government, which could be seen as an expression of MMT ultimately worked. There's a belief that this money is going to be spent over the next several years, and that's why the market is doing so well in anticipation of all of this growth, Weimer says. The concern is Weimer continues that in the future, is that going to create more taxes? Will it, will it create something inflationary? Those are the two longer-term longer problems people are worried about. What it means, to, uh, what it means, uh, means for investors. Ludovic uh, Sabran, chief economist at uh, Elyon's in Munich, explains that there are different market behaviors between risk-tolerant and aversion risk-averse investors because of the way in monetary policy is set. 
people who are rich enough to take risk are going to get richer. But if you want to save for retirement and have a safer risk profile program, excuse me, become profile because you can't allow for a big volatility. You will make less money because the 10-year treasury is low, so Brown explains. There have been they have been seen a new generation of retail investors, which Shabraz dubs the Robinhood generation, where buying up high-risk stocks is good that more people are in the financial market. The problem is how sustainable is it? So Brown said monetary policy has been fueling volatile stocks market investment over something less risky. Well, that, that'll be the end of that part for me in regards to reading that. Um, in regards to my thoughts on the earlier portion of inflation, other things I have seen from recent um, the coronavirus, um, as some would, would call the pandemic. Um, basically, uh, what is going on from what I see is there is a uh, non-violent revolution uh, right now, from, from what I can see anyway, as far as the uh, job market and others, other uh, aspects of the economy, because you have the mandates and because the mandates and because of the short, uh, the wage shortage, I'm not going to say labor shortage, there's plenty of labor out there. There is just uh, less in wage growth. Uh, that is why you have inflation. Uh, because since there are, and like as of today, last I checked, there are plenty of uh, boats, there are plenty of transportation out there waiting and willing to bring in product to be placed on the shelf in order to be sold and purchased for, uh, within the within the um, within the economy. However, you also have mandates in cities all over the country that mandate uh, companies that have 100 people or more to make sure or to mandate that their employees either show that they are negative for coronavirus or get uh, what is known as a jab. Because of that and because of all the crazy um, results that have been coming out, in regards to side effects and more, um, uh, was it mobilities? I don't know. I don't know if I could pronounce it right. Uh, people are not returning to work uh, because of the mandates. They don't want to have to sit there and take multi jabs to prove that they want that prove that they want a job. Um, I think that's what that is what's creating inflation. It's not the lack of uh, employees, it's the lack of wages uh, because of the mandates, because the government is threatening people with their jobs, their livelihood, with their homes because of the, the lack of funding for those who can't go to work because of other kids at home, uh, parents or relatives that may be sick, uh, and also because of the fact that they don't want to go back and have to get a jab that maybe they don't want they're allergic to or they don't want it yet and lose their job anyway. So you have a lot of that. Then you have these bigger corporations that tend to sit there and even though they are the ones in charge of the transportation of said products to be put into uh, circulation of a uh, product on the shelf, they want to sit there and say that there's inflation. They are caused. The, they are causing the inflation, with the mandate, with the mandates and the price gouging and the stuff of that nature. They are causing that. Uh, so is the president. He's currently causing that with mandating companies to have their employees uh, get jabbed in some way or prove their, I guess, loyalty by getting a jab to be able to work. Um, I myself, I forget about it. I've, I, I've said it way too many times. I'm not going to say it again. But this is what causes inflation. When you have too much money uh, in circulation and not enough prior to, to buy it, that's what inflation is. Uh, because if there's not enough product on the shelf, that's to the big corporation is into capitalism, justifies 
upping the price when in reality that product is just literally thousands of miles away on a boat willing and ready to come in and be put on the shelf to bring down those prices it's the same thing with oil uh i believe that one we should be getting off of oil in the first place we should be getting on to renewable energy that will cost less uh, both financially and planet wise uh or the environmental wise so for those who are thinking that all the uh, all the spending is inflationary it is not it's the it's the lack of being able to get those products that are are have been produced have been made have been transported just haven't been put on the shelf in order for them to be processed and built and when not built but sold so think about that before you say spending is creating inflation because spending is not creating the inflation the people in charge of bringing that product to you is causing the inflation the tax loopholes that have uh that have caused the so-called national debt. National debt is quite literally money that was spent into the economy that has not been taxed out. Look at corporate debt. Look at Pentagon spending. Both are in the trillions, and that's not including any kind of interest payments. And yes, if if you are the ones that is making and producing your own currency, you can never go broke. We are not getting money from overseas. In fact, a lot of countries are getting money from us. Israel is one of them. They're getting plenty of money from, from spending bills that Congress has recently done. So look more into that. Do not listen to people like Larry Summers, who were some of the architects behind the recession of 2008, of the Wall Street BS that happened in 2008. All that stuff was literally speculation that caused the housing bubble, speculation of this and that and else in between. That's what happened. Anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, subscribe to this channel, subscribe to WGRN, where this is going to be up as well, uh, and subscribe to my podcast on anchor.fm slash Just Calvin. Peace out for now.